So um, we will start with the real science and start with uh, SACS, which is uh, one integral part of Weon MR. Um, today, uh, Al Kickney uh, will be talking to us about how um, the SACS is used in structural biology, and later on, I'm sure he will tell us about uh, how to use some of the softwares to solve uh, difficult problems. The floor is yours. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Good. So I came a long way here. I come from the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. It is an international organization funded by 21 countries. And its headquarters is in Heidelberg, Germany. And there are outstations in Hamburg, Germany. EBI, the United Kingdom, Grenoble at the ESRF site, Monterotondo in Italy, and there is even an outstation in Australia. <coughs> so I come from Hamburg, and EMBL Hamburg is located on the DAISY site. DAISY is a German synchrotron. It has been refurbished recently, and uh, it's the brightest synchrotron in the world currently. So EMBL was actually founded in Hamburg in 1974. And currently we are focused in uh, macromolecular crystallography and small angle X-ray scattering. So since 2011, we operate at uh, Petra 3. And we have uh, our own life science center there. We have two crystallography beamlines and one Biosax beamline, which I believe is the best Biosax beamline in the world. So our group is uh, fairly large. It's currently 16 people. So it's the group leader is Dmitry Svergun. And what we actually do as a SACS group is we run the P12 beamline and we provide user support and we do collaborative projects. That means that people come to measure their samples and we help them analyzing the data and to answer the questions. We also do a service for the industry for a fair fee. And besides, we are focused on the development of data analysis methods, and at least half of the group are actually software developers, not really real biologists. Besides, we do education and training. We do regular courses. There, are, there is a very popular course uh, for SACS that we do every two years. And we just had one in 2012, and the next one will be in the autumn of 2014. So what is actually small angle X-ray scattering? So it's uh, conceptually a simple technique where you need a solution of molecules. Typically, it is a solution of proteins. Uh, could be solution of nanoparticles, a solution of nucleic acids, RNA, protein complexes, whatever. So the solution needs to be homogeneous and monodisperse, which means that monodisperse means that we have just one type of particles, not a mixture of them, and homogeneous means that they are equally randomly distributed in the solution. I will come back to these two requirements later. So typically we need a fairly small amount of uh, material and we are talking here about a uh, few microliters of uh, solution is a concentration between 1 and 10 milligrams per milliliter. 
So this solution is exposed to x-rays. It could be x-rays from a home source, lab source, or uh, x-rays coming from a synchrotron. So a synchrotron is a particle accelerator where charged particles, typically electrons, are accelerated to nearly the speed of light. And as a byproduct of that acceleration, they emit x-rays. So we use these x-rays. They are filtered to make sure that we have only one wavelength. And after further conditioning of this very intensive x-ray beam, this x-ray beam goes through the solution of particles and this beam is scattered by the solution. So the scattering is further recorded by an X-ray detector, and the data that we record on the X-ray detector is further analyzed. So this is what it looks like at the detector. This is one of the modern Pilatus 2M detectors, and typically we get a scattering pattern that looks like this or like this. And the idea is that samples of different sizes and different shapes produce different scattering patterns. The scattering pattern is uh, isotropic, and this scattering pattern can be radially averaged into a one-dimensional curve that represents how the intensity changes with the angle. So, and the whole idea of small angle X-ray scattering is that objects of different shape and different size produce different scattering patterns. So, what information can we get from the scattering pattern? We can characterize our particles in terms of the radius of duration, in terms of their molecular weight, and their excluded volume. Besides, just based on the, this scattering pattern, we can reconstruct the shape ab initio. Ab initio means that we do not use any extra, any additional information, and it is possible to reconstruct a low resolution envelope that would represent the structure of the particle. If we have some information from other methods, typically high resolution methods, we can analytically calculate their theoretical scattering and compare it to the experimental data. So we can validate structures in solution. Besides, we can perform rigid body modeling if we have more than two structures. For example, and here we have a protein-protein complex, and we do have high-resolution structure of protein A and high resolution structure of protein B. So we would like to see how they look like in a complex. So it is possible to get the structure of the complex using SOX. If we have only partially some information about the structure of the whole protein, we can use SOX to add the missing parts. And it is possible to work with uh, non monodispersed solutions. For example, if it is a solution of monomers and dimers, we can, and we do know the structures of the monomers and the structure of the dimers, uh, we can uh, s estimate how much monomers, how much dimers we have. Besides, SACS permits us to work with uh, unstructured proteins. So actually, about 30% of all proteins, they do not have a folded structure, so they are intrinsically unfolded. And SUX is maybe the only technique that permits us to study the structure of unfolded or partially unfolded proteins. So all this is possible So with uh, using various programs from our ATSAS package. So we are not the only group who develops uh, software for SACS data analysis, but I believe we are quite advanced in this field. If we compare SACS to other structural biology methods, so typically SACS is compared to 
X-ray crystallography, where all particles that we study are oriented the same way, and they are packed in a crystal lattice. So this obviously gives some advantages, but disadvantages as well. So in solution small angle scattering, all particles are randomly distributed in the solution and they all have different orientations and that leads to a significant information loss. However, it also has its advantages. In particular, the sample preparation is relatively easy. So we don't need to grow crystals, we just uh, can use proteins in solution. Besides, uh, unlike NMR, we are not limited by molecular mass. SACs can work with a wide range of sizes, from a few kilodaltons to megadaltons and even gigadaltons. It is applicable under nearly any physiological conditions, so you can vary the temperature, the composition of the buffer, whatever other parameters, and see how the structure is changing in response to these uh, parameters. Besides, it, as I already mentioned, permits us to work with mixtures. However, SACS has a few problems. So first of all, sample preparation. I just said that it is straightforward. However, uh, surprisingly enough, it is not that straightforward to get a monodisperse uh, homogeneous solution. Trust me, I've seen so many aggregated or non monodispersed samples that users bring to the beamline. And SACS cannot tell you if the solution is monodispersed or polydispersed without a priori knowledge. So typically, one would need to check the monodispersity in advance. Another problem is the experiment itself. So, as I said, conceptually, SACS is a simple technique. However, uh, one needs uh, very stable synchrotron beamlines or uh, home sources to perform good uh, solution scattering experiments. Uh, besides, if we do not have a very intensive beam from the synchrotron, but only a home source, uh, it can take hours to perform the actual experiment. Data processing is another challenging part. At the modern third generation synchrotron source, uh, the data is collected in seconds. However, very often months are needed to analyze this data. We are getting better in this field. Many of the steps are nowadays automated, but there is still uh, a certain challenge in terms of data processing. And one of these challenges is the unambiguous data interpretation. So, one of the problems is that one could come up with more than one shape that would produce identical scattering pattern. A typical example is the handness. So, uh, an object and the mirror of this object would produce an absolutely identical scattering pattern. So we cannot really resolve the handness without the use of additional information. So this was a short introduction into the field. And today, I'm going to tell you a bit more about the SACS experiment, about the primary data reduction and primary data analysis how to estimate the overall parameters from a SACS pattern, how to perform ab initio modeling, and how to use SACS with information from complementary methods such as NMR and extra crystallography. And I will demonstrate you how to use rigid body modeling and how to work with mixtures and flexible systems. I will show you how to perform these basic steps. Uh, I guess from the primary data reduction till maybe rigid body modeling. 
let's see how much time we will have for that. And if we have still some time left, I will tell you something about automation of the experiment and data analysis. So, do we have any questions at this point? Okay, everything is clear. Okay, very well. So let's have a look what we can, how the experiment is performed and what information can we estimate or calculate directly from the collected data. So in a typical Sachs experiment, you would need a solution of your particles of interest. Besides, you would also need a blank or a buffer, which is just a pure solvent without any particles in it. So you would need one, two milligrams of purified material. And we can work with concentrations from half a milligram per milliliter, and we can go way higher. However, there are some problems with high concentrated materials. And the exposure time on a modern third generation source is typically a few seconds or fractions of a second. And on a second generation source, it would be a couple of minutes. And if you use a lab source, that would be half an hour, maybe longer for a biological sample, depending on your source. So in an experiment, a solution of particles is exposed to x-rays. The scattering pattern is recorded by an X-ray detector, radially averaged, and then the same is performed with a pure solvent. So let us have a look what we actually have on the detector. So here you see a uh, a scattering pattern from BSA, I believe, and uh, you see how the intensity is changing from the upper part of the scattering pattern. The black thing there is a beam stop, so the beam stop is just a piece of metal that prevents the direct beam from burning the detector, and so we do not see the, actually, the actual beam, but we see only whatever is scattered. So here's another example. This is a very good scatter. This is actually silver BNA. That's not a biological sample. Uh, however, you see that the scattering pattern goes in rings. So that means that it is an isotropic scattering pattern, and it is, it is typical for samples in solution. So here the intensity is coded in color. And you see that the intensity is dropping towards higher angles. So this is a scattering pattern from the modern Pilatus detector. And this is how it looked on the older uh, MAR image plate. So here we have darker colors for higher intensity and lighter colors for lower intensity. So since we have uh, a scattering pattern that is isotropic, we can radially average it. So this is how radial averaging works. And as a result, we get a plot of intensity versus the angle. So this plot is typically normalized against data collection time which means the longer your exposure, the, the higher intensity you get. And it is also normalized against transmitted sample intensity. 
which means that the transmitted beam, the intensity of the transmitted beam is measured at the beam stop and the data is normalized against that value. So this is to ensure that uh, the incoming beam intensity, it, it actually may change over time, especially at a synchrotron. So you need to take that into account. So the data is typically plotted on a logarithmic plot. You may see a double logarithmic plot in some uh, cases, but typically we look at it at a logarithmic plot. So we have uh, a plot how the logarithm of the intensity measured in some arbitrary units is changing with the angle. The angle is measured typically in reverse nanometers and uh, not in degrees. So, and uh, this is actually very convenient. So the angle I would denote in my talk as the letter S. It's convenient, S stands for scattering. And it is uh, expressed as four pi sinus theta over lambda, where two theta is the actual scattering angle and lambda is the wavelength. So if you change the wavelengths, the actual scattering pattern will be compressed or expanded. So, and if we express the S in this way, it's very convenient because we don't care what the angle was. Sometimes the letter Q is, to, is used to denote the modulus of the scattering vector. So these are absolutely the same. There are just two different traditions how to denote the modulus of the scattering vector. So it has absolutely the same meaning. So what you actually have to pay attention at is uh, units. So as I already mentioned, the intensity comes in arbitrary units, it, so it doesn't have any real units. But uh, modulus of the scattering vector can be either in reverse nanometers, as uh, in this case, or it can be in reverse angstroms. So this is just a matter of knowing in which units your data comes. So sometimes the S is expressed as 2 sinus theta over lambda. This is relatively rare, but it still happens. And we will use the 4 pi sinus theta over lambda instead. So during the experiment, during the exposure, your sample might be damaged by radiation. So basically, the, the x-rays, they may harm your sample. They may change the structure of your sample, or they may lead to aggregation. So to monitor against that, typically the same sample is exposed to x-rays more than once. So, and the collected scattering patterns are compared. So here we have one in blue and another one in red. And if there are significant differences between the, part, uh, the scattering patterns, that means that something happened during the exposure. And such data cannot really be used for further analysis. During the experiment, typically, you would notice that it is either automated or you have to measure the same sample twice manually and compare the scattering patterns. And as a biologist, you can do something against it. You can add a small amount of DDT to your sample or whatever, like find a way to minimize the radiation damage. You can shorten the exposure times or you can, uh, at some facilities there is a flow of the sample can be performed. So that means that the sample will be just flowing and not the same volume of the sample will be exposed to x-rays, but every time a different one. This helps to minimize the radiation damage. Oh, however, if you are lucky, if you plan your experiment well and you do not see any differences between the single frames, you can average them together. So if we look at the data collected from the pure solvent, and compare it to the data 
collected from the buffer, we will see that there is actually not that much difference in it. So this is linear scale. And at the higher angles, you see that basically the scattering patterns do not differ much. But if we zoom in, we see that actually the scattering from the solution is systematically, the intensity is systematically higher than the scattering from the solvent. So here the solution is in blue and the solvent is in red. So basically we are looking at these very small differences and uh, the difference between the scattering from the solvent and the scattering from the pure uh, from the solution is about 5%. So that means that the pure solution scatters a lot and the solution with proteins or whatever other particles in it scatters just a little bit higher. So this is a concept of the contrast so which means if you uh, so that if you have some contrast that is high enough to be detectable, you can perform a solution scattering experiment. If the electron density of your sample is the same as the density of the solvent, then you cannot really do much. So this is used in small angle neutron scattering. Uh, I will not go far into neutron scattering, but the basic idea is that if you have, for example, a protein-protein complex, it is possible to uh, deuterate one protein and make it invisible during a neutron scattering experiment. So, however, let's come back to x-rays and we collected the data from the solution of the particles and the data from the solvent. There is a, some difference between them and we can subtract one from another. So, this way we get a buffer subtracted scattering curve that is further normalized against the concentration. Again, the higher the concentration, the higher the scattering intensity. So the more particles you have in your solution and the more they scatter. So, and this scattering pattern is the data set that is used for further analysis and modeling. But before you start with the analysis and modeling, the first question you typically have to ask yourself, can this data be used for the further analysis? Is the data quality good enough? So for this data set, the answer is yes. This is data collected from lysozyme. And this is actually what data of good quality looks like. However, sometimes you may, add, uh, you may end up with uh, scattering patterns that looks different and it's visually obvious for people with some experience that the, red, the, the curvature of the red scattering pattern is different from the blue one. And typically the reason for that is aggregation of the sample. So when I say aggregation, typically I mean unspecific aggregation. So what does it mean? So a monodispersed sample looks like this. You have particles in solution that are floating around. And in case of an aggregated sample, these particles stick to each other and form unspecific oligomers or just aggregated aggregates. So you may have a certain amount of, like monomers in this case, and a certain amount of larger aggregates. Sometimes the amount of larger aggregates is negligible, and you can cut off some lower angles to uh, avoid the scattering from very large aggregates and still get some information from the smaller particles. However, sometimes it is not possible and the data is unusable for further analysis. During the experiment, typically you need to perform a measurement of on a dilution series, which means you measure your sample under more than one concentration, at least three concentrations, typically five concentrations are measured. measured. 
So let's have a look what the data looks like. So this is data from uh, 60 kilodalton protein uh, with a concentration of one milligrams per milliliter. The data was collected on a second generation synchrotron source. And this is the same data coming from uh, uh, the same sample but with a higher concentration. So first of all, they look fairly similar. However, there is a certain shift between these two curves. So they do not overlap quite well, so they are shifted. The reason for this shift is that the concentration that was measured prior to the exposure, it's always measured with a certain error. And what we can see here is how precise the concentration was measured. However, we can scale the two scattering patterns by, in this case, multiplying the higher concentration data and scaling is typically what you would do in SACS without any problems. So as I mentioned, the intensity is measured in arbitrary units, which means you can multiply the intensity of the whole curve. And the data will not change. So the intensity sometimes is measured in absolute units. However, intensity in absolute units is good for only one reason. It's the uh, estimate of the molecular weight of your sample, and we will come to that a bit later. So if we look at these two scattering patterns, we will see that at higher angles, there is no difference in the profile apart from the signal-to-noise ratio. However, if we look at the lowest angles, we will see that there is a systematic difference between these two curves. This is a so-called concentration effect or interparticle interaction effect. So what does it mean? In a typical, ideal, homogeneous solution, the particles are randomly distributed and randomly oriented in the solution. And that means that the particles do not interact with each other. On the very dilute solutions, this is actually the case. However, with higher concentrations, the particles may or may not, typically they will, interact with each other. That means that they will either attract each other or repulse. So if you have attractive interactions, you will have in your solution uh, areas where there are more particles and areas where there are fewer particles. So, and this will be also, will influence the uh, recorded scattering signal. If you have repulsive interactions, the particles may uh, perform like kind of some short, how do you say that, short order, short distance order. So, which means that the probability of finding another particle uh, away from, from one particle will be higher than random. However, there will be no long distance order, so they will not crystallize. It will be still a solution. However, the orientation, the positions will not be random anymore. So this is an unwanted effect, so, which means that we would prefer to measure higher concentrations because they give us a better signal to noise ratio. However, these higher concentrations will be affected by interparticle interactions. So what can we do with it? We can find an overlapping region where the data basically looks identical. And we can cut the higher angles of the low concentration and cut the lower angles of the high concentration. And this way, we can obtain a merged scattering pattern that will have the data from the low concentration in the low angles. Uh, merged data in between, and higher angles will come from the higher concentration where the signal-to-noise ratio is better, and the, where the interparticle interference effects are not visible. So, I will assume a lot in my talks that we work with globular particles, 
like imagine a very well folded protein. However, SAX is also applicable to unfolded proteins. And there is a very easy way to see if your protein is folded or unfolded if you do SAX. So the way of doing that is to plot the data as a Kratky plot. So Kratky plot means that instead of the logarithm of the intensity, you plot the intensity multiplied by the square of S. And here we have a folded scattering pattern from a folded protein in blue, and it will have a very distinctive peak. If we compare it to a scattering pattern from an intrinsically unfolded protein, we will see no peak and the data will just go up. If we have something in between, for example, a protein with flexible linker, we will see something in between. So there will be a certain peak, however, it will be not as broad as from a globular protein. So once we did our quality checks, we can proceed to the actual data analysis. So the beauty of SAX is that if you have different shapes, they will produce different scattering patterns. So for example, here we have a scattering pattern from a solid sphere of a certain uh, diameter, like 10 nanometers, I believe, and a scattering pattern from a hollow sphere of the same diameter and the same molecular weight, but hollow inside. And you can see that the scattering pattern is different. And if we compare it to the analytically computed scattering patterns from other simple shapes, we will see that each time we will get a different scattering pattern. So these five objects are the same size, however the shape of the scattering is different. If we take an object, so the same sphere, and we'll vary its size, so this is a, a sphere uh, twice the diameter, the green one is twice the diameter compared to the blue one, you will see that the scattering pattern changes. So if we further increase the size, we will see that the scattering pattern changes further. So basically, as I already mentioned, sucks is based on the idea that objects of different shape and objects of different size produce different scattering patterns. So, coming back to the experimental setup and having the size of the particle in mind, we let's have a look at what data range we would like to measure and analyze. So, there is a typical question is what is the resolution of SAX? So SAX is a low resolution matter, but how low is the resolution? So this question uh, could be answered is that the minimum size uh, that you can measure uh, is pi over S max, where S max is the maximum angle. However, this is a very bad answer. Because if we look at this uh, scattering patterns that were analytically computed from 20 different proteins of proteins of various sizes, we can see that they behave very differently in the lower angles, so up to five uh, reverse nanometers. But the higher the angle, the more differences you see. So at very high angles, where you could theoretically reach the atomic distances, uh, there are no differences in the scattering patterns. This is because the particles in solution are randomly oriented, and the low-resolution information is 
kind of smeared out, lost. Besides, it's uh, experimentally it's hard to measure higher angles because of the uh, drop of the intensity with the angle, and you will have a lot of noise at the higher angles. So this is why typically SACS, which by the way stands for small angle X-ray scattering, means that the angles that are typically measured are till four to six reverse nanometers. So if you measure higher angles, it is called box, wide angle X-ray scattering, and this information from the wide angles can be used in some cases. However, in structural biology, it is typically just small angle X-ray scattering. So let's us have a look at the other side of the scattering pattern, namely at the lowest angles. So we cannot really measure the angle zero because we have the beam there. We cannot really measure very small angles because, as I showed you before, there is a beam stop that protects the detector from the incoming beam. So you don't have the information of very, very small angles. And there is a relation with the maximum size of the particles that you are measuring and the lowest angle that you record. So, which means that if you have very large particles, you have to record more smaller angles. So if you're dealing with biological samples and you come to a beam line that is optimized for scattering from biological samples, typically this beam line would be optimized in a way that you can measure proteins of various sizes. However, in some cases it is possible to ask to change the sample detector distance if you have a very small or a very big particle. So speaking of sizes of the particles, there is a classical parameter that can be estimated directly from the scattering pattern. Now this parameter is called the radius of duration. And radius of duration means an average of square center of mass distances in the molecule. So if you take a molecule, you can estimate its overall size by finding its center of masses and measure the distances to each atom in the molecule and taking the average of this distance. So let us look at this example. We have two proteins. Let's say they are proteins. One is very compact protein A and the protein B is expanded. So I want you now to think a little bit which one has a larger radius of duration. So we have option one that the RG of A is larger, option B, uh, option two that the RG of B is larger, and option three that they have the same RG. So who would vote for option one? Okay, option two. Very well. Option three. Okay, not bad. Good. So indeed, uh, the more compact protein would have a smaller radius of duration compared to an extended one. So let us look at these two bodies. So who thinks that the RG of A is larger than the RG of B? So it's just like a, a, a flat disk and the circle empty inside. So who thinks that the RG of A is larger than B? 
okay, who thinks that the uh, RG of A is smaller than the RG of B. Okay, so who thinks they are equal? Okay, the second answer is actually correct. So, think of the definition. That's the average of center of mass distances in the molecule. So, in the molecule A, you have a lot of small distances close to the center of it. And in molecule B, you have only large distances. So, which means that the RG of A will be actually smaller than the RG of B. So, is that clear? Okay, so this is, I guess, I gave you an idea what an RG is and practical applications of RG apart from just seeing if it is larger or smaller. Yes, typically is it ex extended or compact. The radius of duration can be estimated directly from the scattering pattern. If we plot our scattering pattern as a natural logarithm of the intensity versus the square of S, so we will see uh, that the uh, curves will change being plotted this way and they will have a linear region which is close to the smaller angles. From the slope of this linear region of uh, data plotted in the so-called Guignet plot, named after André Guignet, uh, who discovered in 1939 that independently from which shape your particles have, it is possible to calculate the radius of duration or estimate, approximate the radius of duration of the particle in solution uh, directly from the scattering pattern. So, which means regardless what shape your particles are, you can estimate their size directly from the scattering pattern. Besides, a Guignet plot is a good way of checking the quality of your data. So, if you have a monodispersed homogeneous solution of your particles, you will have a good linear Guignet range. So, however, if you have an aggregated or severely poorly dispersed sample, or uh, something went wrong during the background subtraction, you may not get a linear Guignet plot. Besides, uh, it is good for estimating the zero angle intensity. You can uh, extrapolate the data to zero angle, which we cannot measure. And besides, it tells you where if, you, if the data doesn't look good at very small angles, where to stop it. So let us have a look how it is done. So this is a scattering pattern from a protein of 66 kilodaltons called bovine serum albumin, or BSA. This is uh, our favorite protein, which we use for standard measurements. So this is its scattering pattern, and if we look at very small angles and plot them as a Guignet plot, we will see that the data looks almost linear. So there is a program that can estimate the radius of duration for you uh, automatically using the Guinea approximation, and this program is called AutoRG. What it does, it checks all intervals, checks how linear they are, finds the most linear interval, here in red, and from the slope of this linear interval, we can very easily calculate the radius of duration. The intercept of this uh, linear uh, part will give you the intensity of the zero angle, which is impossible to measure uh, experimentally, but which can be used for estimation of the molecular weight. So the good news is that the higher the molecular mass 
of the particle of interest, the higher the intensity in the zero angle. So, which means if your molecule has more atoms, it will scatter more. That's quite straightforward. So here we have in blue the scattering pattern from a lysozyme, and in red we have the scattering pattern from apoferritin. Apoferritin is way larger than lysozyme, so uh, which is also visible from the plot. So this is used to estimate the molecular mass. So typically what you would do is you would measure, so remember our intensity is actually in some arbitrary units. So you can either try to calibrate your beam line to get absolute units, but it's way easier to measure a standard. So if you do socks from proteins, a standard would be a standard protein, which is easy to prepare and where you know the molecular weight. It could be lysozyme, it could be glucose isomerase, it could be bovine serum albumin, which we use in Hamburg. So the molecular weight of BSA is 66 kilodaltons, so you measure its forward scattering, I0, and you measure the forward scattering of your protein of interest. And this way you can estimate the molecular weight of your protein of interest. So here I took some data from our beam line and uh, measured the forward scattering of BSA. So it was 11.7 arbitrary units. And I also checked the radius of duration of BSA and I got 3.1 nanometers. So I actually know that the theoretical RG of BSA should be slightly smaller and uh, the BSA that we quickly prepare from a powder at the beam line is not ideally monodisperse. So it has a small amount of dimers. However, it is good enough for our purposes. So, and if we estimate the I0 of the lysozyme sample, and from it calculate the molecular mass, we got 21 kilodaltons. So who knows the real molecular weight of the lysozyme? 14, something like that, yeah? So that's not a very precise method to estimate the molecular weight. However, it is, so the reasons for that are, as I said, the BSA is not ideally monodispersed here. So when you measure BSA, you measure the concentration of BSA, which is measured with a certain error. BSA also has some interparticle interference and probably you were too lazy to make the whole dilution series for BSA and to extrapolate it to zero concentration. When you measure the concentration of your sample, it's also subject of a certain, uh, certain error. So, and you have to normalize against concentration, remember? And normalization against concentration is you just divide the intensity by the concentration. So, hence, the way of estimating the molecular mass is not very precise. So keep in mind it's something like 20% error bars. So here in case of, of, of apoferritin, I got something like 450 kilodaltons, and it should be larger from what I remember. However, this is good enough to tell you the oligomeric state of your protein. So I'm sure here that the lysozyme is still a monomer and the apoferritin is a multimer. <laughs> so I, I don't remember what, which, what was the oligomeric number of, of this apoferritin. And uh, this is what this way of estimating the molecular mass is good for. And it is very important to perform this check because it's a very good quality check that tells you if, uh, if you actually measured what you expect.
So there is another very good quality check that is independent of the intensity values, which means it's independent uh, of the errors you make during the concentration measurements. But let me first tell you about the Porod law. So the Porod law is says that the intensity decay is proportional to s to the power of minus 4 at higher angles for globular particles of uniform density. So globular particles means that your particle is not that much different from a sphere. Like BSA is a global particle, lysozyme is a global particle, apoferritin is a global particle, and However, if you measure a very long rod, it's not globular. Or if you measure a very flat particle, that's another not globular particle. So if you have a globular particle, and you can assume that at that resolution, the density of the particle is uniform, it tells us that the intensity decay is proportional to the s to the power of minus 4. That means if you plot your data on the Porod plot, which is uh, intensity multiplied to the s to the power of 4, and you can subtract the constant from the data. So this constant is a cheap way of accounting for uh, non-uniform density. Actually, apoferritin is empty inside. So you cannot really say that it's uniform density. But the data will look like like it will follow the forward plot. It will fluctuate around a straight line at this plot. So this is not that much interesting. However, uh, Porod also figured out a way how to estimate the volume directly from the scattering pattern. So if you take your data and find a constant to subtract from this data, that would make your data fluctuate around this following the Porod law, it is possible to estimate the volume directly from the data. So let's have a look at our example. And using this formula, I got 14 cubic nanometers from the lysosome data and almost 1,000 cubic nanometers from the apoferritin data. So for proteins, if you take the volume in cubic nanometers and divide it by 1.6, 1 1.6 to, you will get roughly the size in kilodaltons. This is another very good quality check that will give you an estimate how good your data is. So here we got 9 kilodaltons for the lysozyme and 610 for Apoferritin, so 9 is a bit on the lower side. We expect 14. Yeah, it's still good enough uh, for such a small protein. And in case of apoferritin, it's slightly larger than we expected. However, it's also no surprise because apoferritin is not really of uniform density. However, again, it gives us information about the oligomeric state and the quality of the data. So... The next step in data analysis is typically the distance distribution function. So if we take our particle and measure all possible distances, so interparticle distances, and make a plot, what is the probability of finding a certain distance inside the particle? So we will get something like this. So this is called the gamma function, and it tells us that for very short distances, the probability of finding it inside the particle will be 1. And for larger distances, uh, the probability will be lower. And we can find the largest distance called d max, after which the probability of finding a distance larger than the largest distance will be 0. So Typically, a gamma function is not used for uh, data representation, but we use a so-called PO-FAR function. So PO-FAR function is this probability multiplied by the R-squared 
so the square of the distance. And if we plot it this way, we will get something like this. So this is a typical P of R function. And let us have a look at the P of R functions from bodies of different shape. So if we take our example with uh, four bodies of different shape but same maximum distance and same molecular weight, we will see that not only the scattering patterns from them will be different, but also the distance distribution function will be different. So here we have in red a typical distance distribution function for a globular particle, which is like bell-shaped, and we see that for other other shapes, we will get different distance distribution particles. So actually, the scattering pattern that we measure experimentally is a Fourier transform of the distance distribution function. So what we measure is the distance distribution function, the Fourier transform of it. So And it is possible to compute the theoretical intensity directly from the P of R. However, to do it the other way around, to compute the P of R, which would give us a characteristic of our particle in real uh, space, is uh, difficult. Because here, as you can see, to compute the P of R, we have to integrate uh, the angle from zero angle to the infinity angle. So zero angle, I kind of could imagine we can extrapolate to the zero angle, but we cannot really measure the infinity angle. So what is done in this case is that it is possible to come up with a certain P of R and to Fourier transform it back to the intensity. And then to compare this, it's called regularized intensity, to compare it to the experimental data. There is a beautiful program called GNOME that permits you to do that. And the latest versions even have an automatic mode, and I will show you how to do that without too much hassle. So here we have the distance distribution functions from the lysozyme and from the apophyridine. So these functions basically represent the shape of the particles, but averaged over all orientations. So it's an important feature of the distance distribution function is that it converges smoothly to zero. And where it converges to zero is the d max. So the d max is the maximum size of the particle. And this is another important parameter that you can estimate from Sachs data, is what is the maximum size of your particle of interest. Besides, the P of R function is a good indication of the quality of the data. So here in green, we have the original data from the lysozyme. You can see that uh, at very low angles, it doesn't behave very well. It goes down. This is because this is data recorded very close to the beam stop. So typically, we do the Guinea analysis and cut off this data, so you can see the as minimum at this plot. And after cutting this data, we can use the program GNOME and to find the regularized function here in black. So the black curve is the Fourier transform of the P of R function. And as we can see here, it fits the uh, data pretty well. However, we need to remember that we cannot cut too much small angles. Because if we cut too many small angles, we will lose information about the overall size of the particle. And this way, we can fit a different P of R function into our data. So, which means if you cut more and more small angles, you will just lose the information of the overall size. And the problem might be that 
the model that you will build afterwards will fit the rest of the data, but will have the wrong size. So let us have a look at this example. I took a protein and four different, different oligomeric states. So it exists as a monomer. However, I constructed two different dimers, a compact dimer and an extended dimer, and the hexamer out of this monomer. I computed analytically the scattering patterns from these four particles, and then I started an automated program that estimated me the P of R functions. So as I mentioned, uh, the P of R function should converge smoothly to zero. Here the triangles show the actual maximum size of the molecule and uh, the automated program called Autognom did a good job in this case. However, here we see some wobbly parts at the high R values and this is not that well. I will show you how to adjust these parameters manually. So I think let us wrap up slowly the primary data reduction and analysis. So I told you what happens during the actual experiment, how you perform the radial averaging. So first you have a 3D object that you uh, get a 2D scattering pattern from. And then this 2D scattering pattern is averaged into a one-dimensional data set from which we can get actually quite a few parameters characterizing the original 3D object. So using various plots, we can analyze the quality of the data. And the next talk will be about how to get uh, back to 3D from the one-dimensional data set. So the good news is that all these parameters nowadays can be computed automatically. So at some beam lines, you have a pipeline, the data analysis and reduction pipeline running that would do all this boring job for you. And you will end up with a summary that looks like this, where you have the radius of duration, the Dmax, the molecular weight estimated either from the forward scattering or from the volume uh, as a table. However, it is important to know how these parameters are obtained in order to double check these results if needed. So, and thank you for your attention. So, this is the basics. So if you didn't get something at this stage, please do ask questions because otherwise it will be more complicated further. So questions? Yes, please. So typically they just look like from looking at the data. So like from the experience you know that the curvature of the blue curve, so which goes like this is correct, and if it goes like this, it's not correct. Okay. However, uh, the <coughs> more formal way would be to try to estimate the radius of duration. So if you have a mixture of particles of different sizes, which is typically the case of unspecific aggregation, you will get many, many different Guinea regions averaged together. And from the red curve here, it is not possible to find a lin linear region in it. So you will just simply not be able to estimate the radius of duration from the data. That's typically how you know that it is aggregated. Thank you. Yes, please. 
I will show you how to do that in the software. So nowadays, you, the automated program does it for you. However, like in the past, people would just plot it in the Guinea plot. And use a ruler to to see which part is the most uh, is the most linear. However, there is uh, also there are certain limitations for the. Uh, for the applicability of the Guinea law. From the mathematics, uh, you have to choose a region where the maximum S value multiplied by the RG is less than 1. So if you take the maximum S, so here at 0 0.2 and multiply it by RG, it's, it's like 3. It should be less than 1. However, uh, uh, for in case of proteins, it is possible to push this limit a little bit further. So and typically we say that it should be less than 1.3. This wouldn't give you that much uh, options for finding the radius of duration. However, I will, uh, I will show you later how to do it using the software. Any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, could you judge the power dispersity from the uh, Guinea plot? Sometimes, yes. So if the sample is severely poorly dispersed, then you will just not get a linear region. However, if you have a mixture of, let's say, two different particles, and if the sizes of the particles are very different, like 10 times different, then you will kind of have two linear regions on the Guinea plot. So it will go up at the very low angles. So you will be able to find two Guinea uh, intervals with different RG values. However, this is a rare case. Typically, you have something like a mixture of monomers and dimers. And this you will not see at all. It will, like scattering from monomers, average together with the scattering of dimers. And the radius of duration you will estimate will be between something between the RG of a monomer and RG of a dimer. So if you suspect, so I'll scratch that. In any case, before performing sucks from, uh, from your sample in solution, you need to make sure that it is monodispersed or at least have some information how monodispersed it is. Typically, this is done using DLS. There are other methods to see how monodispersed your sample is. But if you have a mixture and you don't know about that, there is no way, usually no way, you can tell that for sure from the SACS data. Yes, please. So, uh, can you give a general idea about uh, about the SAS in the wet lab? How you, what kind of thing you add in a solution to ensure the more dispersion or to improve the uh, more dispersion? So, typically, so I'm not a biologist. <laughs> <laughs> so, but typically. Uh, the wet lab person or the person who works with the protein uh, knows what keeps the protein happy. So like as long, so there is the right buffer for the protein and typically people also try to crystallize it so they normally know what keeps the protein monodisperse. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot give you, so it's not my area of, uh, yeah, of interest. So I cannot give you any further uh, advices. However, we have some slides from presentations how to prepare the sample before performing SACS. I can show you these slides later. <laughs>
More Excuse questions? Me. Yeah. Is it possible that you get the uh, data and it looks like it's not aggregated, but the auto RG program tells you it's aggregated? Yeah, that happens. It has a module that just measures uh, the slope, so the, the curvature. It's a very simple module, and it will just look at this data and, and check the curvature, and if the curvature goes like this, then it will tell you that it is aggregated. However, it's just a guess. So the, if AutoRG tells you a sample is aggregated, it's just a hint that look at the data, and what you should look at first is the radius of duration the program gives you and the quality estimate the program gives you. So if the quality estimate is high, as the RG has a low error bar, then probably it's not aggregated. There is another case when the data may look like this. That's uh, data from intrinsically unfolded proteins will also look visually the same as the red curve. So, so however, so an intrinsically unfolded protein means that it exists in different conformations in the solution. So strictly speaking, the, the, the oligomeric state of this protein will be the same, but strictly speaking, the, the solution is not monodisperse. So the way to check that is, so normally you know that your protein is unfolded. The way to check that would be to plot it using the Kratky plot. And the Kratky plot from aggregated samples typically shows you a big peak, hinting that it is a globular protein. And if you have a, an intrinsically unfolded protein, you will not see the peak of the Kratky plot. Yes, please. And, and you, you mentioned that we cannot cut too much uh, the small angle data. Yep. So typically, how much is too much? And Usually, typically, what's the data range we should use for the for for analysis? Yeah, so that depends on your on the size of your particle, and this is what you have to keep in mind. So that the minimum angle that you have shouldn't be should be less than pi divided by the maximum size found in your particle. So. This minimum angle is not just how much you cut the data, but it's also how much you measure it. So that you collect a certain range at the, at the beam line. And uh, if you have a very large particle and you just didn't collect enough small angle data, you will, be, you will notice it immediately. You will be not able to estimate the radius of duration using the Guinea approximation. Just the, all the Guinea range will be on the beam stop. So sometimes it is possible to change the sample detector distance at the beam line. However, typically it's 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 a complicated procedure. So when we have uh, particles that are too large, we just put the detector further away, and we this way we can collect the smaller angles. But this is. Uh, how you how you know if you have enough small angles or, or not. Good. If there are no further questions, and we still have like 40 minutes till the lunch break, I think I can show you uh, how to perform the actual data analysis. So I brought experimental data from this measurement. So and this measurement, we analyze data from two proteins. Let's call them protein A and protein B. <coughs> we know that protein A is about 50 kilodaltons, and the protein B is about 11. And we measured the separate proteins and their proteins these two proteins in a complex, or at least we hope that we measure the complex. When you work with protein-protein complexes, uh, you have to remember, A, to measure the separate proteins, and B, to 
make sure that the complex is actually formed. Because sometimes you see that you have a mixture and not a complex. And sometimes you can have a mixture of the complex and separate uh, dissociated parts. So here we have these two proteins. We collected data under two concentrations, both from both proteins and from the complex. And this is what a typical measurement looks like. So normally you start measuring water. So this is done just to make sure that your station, your beamline works fine. And besides, when you measure water, you just not measure water, but you also measure scattering from the sample cell. If the sample cell got dirty during the previous experiments, you will see that the scattering from water changes. So however, normally, this is done by the beamline scientist, and you measure the buffers and the samples. So the buffer is just a pure solvent, and the sample is the solution of your particles. So here we have both proteins in the complex in the same buffer. And typically, we measure buffer, sample, buffer, sample, buffer, sample, buffer, sample. So there is a buffer measurement between each sample measurements. So let us first have a look at the data from the two proteins. And what I'm going to do first is I, I will have a look at the data from the buffer only. If the data from the buffers are good enough, I can average this data together to improve the statistics. And after which, I can subtract the signal from the buffer from the signal of the sample, and to get the <coughs> buffer subtracted data. So this data will be like how the protein scatters in vacuum without any buffer. So first I will start the program called Primus. So this is a cross-platform <coughs> version of the program. It's available under quite many operating systems. And I will load the raw unsubtracted data. So and this is what it looks like. So let me keep only the data from the buffers only. So this is the data from the buffers. As you can see, the curves look very, uh, very much alike. They have a certain amount of noise. This is data from a second generation synchrotron source. It's very old data. And if we look at the lower angles of the buffer signals, we will actually notice some differences. So you can see a systematic difference in the intensity. So this difference is because the incoming beam of that synchrotron, it, the intensity of it is changing. And the normalization against the changing intensity of the incoming beam is never perfect. So however, this uh, data looks quite good to me. So what I can do is I can take the two buffers, one buffer that was measured before the sample and one buffer that was measured after the sample, and I can average them. So, so this, this will be my average buffer. So, and I can do the same for the next two buffers. So, now this is how the curves. So, and I click again the average button, and I get the average curve. So these are the next two buffers. I average them together. Oh, this is correct. <coughs> and the next two buffers. I average these as well. So now we have, for each of the sample measurements, we have these four averaged buffers. <coughs> 
on a very good beam line and a very good synchrotron. For example, I've been to the Australian synchrotron recently. They have a very stable SACS beam line and a very stable incoming beam. They can afford to measure the buffer just once and then just measure all the samples. However, I would advise you not to trust that unless you happen to be at that particular synchrotron and to perform many buffer measurements in between. So now we have all the buffers and we can do the buffer subtraction. So here in green we have the scattering pattern from the protein A under 16.3 mix per mil. And that is a scattering pattern, wait a minute, from the same protein uh, under 2.7 mix per mil. So as you can see, the absolute scattering is very different, and we have it much higher for the, for the higher concentration. So if we just select the data from the sample of protein A and the buffer, we can subtract the data by clicking the subtract button. Please be careful, sometimes you subtract not the buffer from the sample, but the sample from the buffer, and you get a curve that is all negative, which doesn't make any sense. And some programs, when you plot it, when a logarithmic plot, they will take the absolute value and it will still look good, but absolutely useless for further analysis. So to subtract the buffer from the sample, I just click the subtract button, and this is... Uh, our buffer subtracted curve. So do you think it's a good data? So not bad actually. So we see some noise at the higher angles and some lower angles definitely do not behave uh, according to the green yellow, but we will have a look at that later. So let me subtract the, the other buffers. So number five was our next sample. So when I click the subtract button, it does not only perform the arithmetical subtraction, but it also reads from the file what was the concentration of the sample and divides the subtracted data by this concentration. So this is very convenient. However, you have to be aware that it is done automatically for you. Good. So now we have we have our four samples subtracted with uh, buffer subtracted signals from the four measurements that we did. So let me load it again. So, in red we have the higher concentration of the protein A. And, no, scratch it. In red we have the lower concentration data from protein A, and in green, I hope nobody is colorblind, uh, we have the data from the higher concentration. So, as you can see, there are strong particle interference effects that affect the signal. So we have to merge these two data sets. So how do we do that? We first find uh, <coughs> an overlap between these two data sets. So and we can do that by choosing something like 
like this. So you can see that they overlap here quite well. Maybe I can adjust this range manually to make it a little bit better. So I think this is good enough. So now you have like your composite curve that has low angle data at low angles and high angle data at high angles. And this curve can be merged together. As usual, there is an automated command line program that can do that for you automatically. But you also need to know how to do that manually. So before I merge them, let's have a look at the radius of duration of the lower concentration curve. So this can be done in the radio, radius of duration tool. And this tool makes a little uh, guinea plot. So here black dots are the experimental data. And it automatically had chosen a certain linear range where the fit so the Guinea plot is fairly linear. So if you don't like it, you can change it. For example, this still looks very linear. However, there are also the SRG limits. So the SRG limits is the minimum S, so this value, multiplied by the current radius of duration estimated from the slope of the red curve. And the other limit is the S max RG multiplied by the values of, uh, of R. So if you take any <coughs> simple body and compute the P of R function from it, you will never see something like that, such a shoulder. So if you see a shoulder in your data, there could be like two reasons for it. One reason is that you actually do have a small amount of aggregates that actually do have very large distances in them. And this shoulder is trying to, to kind of approximate your data from the mixture. Uh, and uh, this is also a good quality check. If you see something like that, that's, that's not, not very good. However, another reason for that could be that the estimation of the Dmax is wrong. Let's us try to increase the maximum size or maybe let's first decrease it. So let's see what happens if we take a smaller maximum size, the, the curve, so the P of R function will look uglier and uglier. And if we take a very wrong Dmax estimate, so here you can see that the blue curve, which is a Fourier transform of our current uh, P of R function, uh, actually doesn't even fit the experimental data. So this P of R function is pretty useless. So if I click the autognom button, the program will again try to estimate the P of R function. And we can play a little bit with the data range. And with the Dmax, let's try to increase the Dmax. And yeah, actually, so if we increase it too much, you will see that the P of R function becomes negative, which is not good. However, there is always an optimum value. Mm, it's more, even more, yeah, something like that. So this is a decent P of R function that being Fourier transformed back to the reciprocal space still fits the uh, experimental data. So let's save it. And that was the protein A. And let's write down what was the Dmax again. I think it was, yeah, let's do it again. So 10.4. So put in A has Dmax of 10.4 nanometers. And let's do the same with the protein B. 
so this is what the automatic estimate gives me I think this is good enough. So again, we have a, a good-looking POFR function uh, that being Fourier transformed fits our experimental data. And we got a Dmax of 4.7. So let's write it down. So the Dmax of protein B is 4.7. So and again, clearly the protein A is larger than the protein B. And let's save this POFR function as Protein B. So, we still have a few minutes. Let's go wild and do the same for the data that we collected from the complex. To save you some time, I already have the merged and average data. So this is the data from the complex, and let us check the radius of duration. Yeah, fair enough. So we got a very linear RG of 2.8 and I0 of 140. So for the complex we got the RG of 2.8 nanometers and I0 of 140 arbitrary units. So, wait a minute. We have the RG of 2.8 of a complex of protein A and protein B and the RG of protein A was actually larger so for protein A we got 2.86 and for the complex we got 2.8. Do we actually have a complex? So who thinks that we do have a complex? Okay, who thinks that we have a mixture of protein A and protein B? Okay, good. So me, personally, I wouldn't be able to tell. So it is possible to have both a mixture and uh, a complex with this RG. However, let's continue and estimate the molecular weight of the complex. So if we take the 140, the forward scattering of the complex, and put it in our formula, what would be the molecular weight of the complex? Who can tell me? Come again? 58. 58 kilodaltons. So, and since the protein A was 50 and uh, protein B was 11, we expect something like 61. So, if we had a mixture, we would have and estimate between 50 and 11, so less than 50 and more than 11. However, we got something very close to the expected molecular weight of the complex. Hooray! We have a complex. Isn't that impressive? Come on. <laughs> so, again, this is real data, and I will show you later how we can proceed with it. But I think first we... Uh, I will answer your questions. Do you have any questions uh, to what I showed you? Yes, please. Can we use other, uh, for example, light design as a standard? Sure. I mean, like, you can, as a standard, you can use whatever you feel comfortable with. So the choice of the standard is usually 
if you measure proteins, you usually use a protein as a standard. If you use a protein as a standard and want to estimate the molecular weight of uh, nucleic acid, <coughs> then you need to to take into account that the contrast of the nucleic acid is approximately two times higher than the contrast of the protein. So you cannot really use this formula, but you have to, to like multiply it by two, roughly. So if you use something specific, then probably use, uh, yeah, if you use dendrimers normally, you use another uh, standard. However, the choice of standard is very simple. It's A, it should be easy to prepare, B, it should be of a stable oligomeric state, and C, it should be well characterized. So BSA is also very cheap, so that's why we use BSA. However, we encourage the users to come with their own standard, and I'm, every time I'm very surprised when they come, and they start complaining, like, why do you use BSA? Glucososomerase is much better. Like, yeah, why didn't you bring glucososomerase? <laughs> so the choice of the standard is normally not that important. Yes, please? Um, so <coughs> when we are transporting, uh, so when we fully transform the PR function back to yeah. the I function, the yeah. intensity curve, how do we judge whether the, the curve we calculate fits the data? I mean, just by eye, so is there any parameters that we can use? Like in X-ray, we, uh, we have R3 to judge. And uh, yes, so is there any, any parameter that help us yes. to judge? There is one. However, uh, judging it by I <laughs> is <laughs> actually better. So uh, th there is a parameter, obviously. Somewhere, if you, if you open the file, so let us have a look. <coughs> so this is a file that we saved. If you open it with a text editor, So we will have a lot of technical information about the, the actual calculation of the Fourier transform. So however, we will get the so-called total estimate. And I think 1 is good and 0 is bad. And it will also give us a, a hint if this solution is reasonable or not. However, when you perform the GNOME analysis, so let's let's do it on the complex. So you can try to play with the parameters. So for example, if you put a very large G max, you will see that this is there is something wrong here, however, it will still fit your data very well. But the POFR function obviously looks doesn't look good. Besides, you will get a warning that with this Dmax, your S value is too small. So this is another kind of automatic quality estimate for you. If you use very small Dmax, you will see that it will not fit the data. So I believe if I save it now, it will give me a worse estimate. However, usually you have to choose between two very close solutions, and it requires some, some feeling. And as you can see, there is, there is an automated way that will estimate it for you quite well, actually. And very often, you don't even need to change this. Yeah. yeah, in the documentation, you will find more details about how it is estimated and other parameters that, are, that may help you. Yeah. Yes, please? Uh, in 
at least in, in our settings in Taiwan, the um, data has been subtracted, the buffer contribution has been subtracted automatically. And sometimes at the high, high angle region, then you get negative sex intensity. And then I think for the program, then you, it, it, it has some problems. So uh, in that case, other than repeating to get the better data, is there a way that, for example, because sometimes you get a dip and you get some intensities again in the higher mm -hmm. angle. Mm -hmm. Um, is there a way we can somehow still make use of the higher angle data but circumvent the negative contribution? Not really. So if you if you work with polyns, <coughs> then uh, you shouldn't have negative points or you shouldn't have too many negative points. So if we have a look. Okay, let's look at the complex, and I will plot it as an absolute scale. You will see that it is, yeah, okay, he's all just positive. However, let's have a look at, yeah, the smaller protein on absolute scale. You see that there are some counts that are negative. So, however, uh, if you get systematically negative, not just this few double points, but systematically negative parts of the curve, then this is typically because the buffer measurement doesn't really match the sample. So the most common reason is that the buffer was not taken from the dialysis, but it was prepared the same way as the buffer in which the sample is in. So this is not good enough because of these very small differences. Another reason for that is improper normalization. So the normalization is never perfect, especially if you have, yeah, depends, heavily depends on the beam line, but sometimes the normalization is, is not correct. It's in this case, you can scale the buffer slightly, but it's not recommended. It's better to repeat the experiment under better conditions because this is already scaling the buffer is, is data manipulation. So, And there is another case, and the samples, they actually absorb the x-rays. So, And it could be that the absorption of the x-rays is uh, different from the buffer and from the buffer with the sample. Normally, this difference is, is negligible. However, and besides, we... Uh, normalize against the transmitted beam intensity. So to, nor to, to normalize against that. However, in some cases, uh, we have, uh, like imagine a solvent that we measure and very large, typically very anisotropic, so very, for example, very elongated particles in this solvent. So what you want to subtract is the signal from the solvent without the particles inside, which is not possible to do. However, if you like have high concentration of large, highly anisotropic uh, particles, it could be that you that the subtraction will be not done correctly. So, a typical way uh, to compensate against this effect is to use a constant. So, you can add a constant, or typically you subtract a constant from the data, but this probably will not help you if you have systematically negative counts. So I would advise to repeat the experiment. We do have cases uh, similar to the last um, scenario mm -hmm. in the sense that we have a lot of additive in the, in the buffer. Mm -hmm. And with high protein concentration, you basically have fewer contributions from, say, denaturant, but they, they actually absorb X-ray, for example. Mm -hmm. Our transmission drop a lot, yeah. And then, th and then between the blank and the protein sample, mm -hmm. then at uh, say some angles, then we, we lose a lot of uh, information because of this negative uh, effect. So, so in that particular case, adding a constant is acceptable. Or so wait, wait a minute. But <coughs> if you have these additives. You you do have them in the buffer and in the sample. Yes. Or? So so one 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 type of experiment we are doing is to to look at denatured proteins. Mm -hmm. So we use a lot of um, a lot of chemicals. Yeah. 
to denature it. Mm -hmm. And then you then do the same for a blank and also for the protein. Mm -hmm. But at high protein concentration, then mm -hmm. one, one possibility is, like you said, then we have volume that are excluded by mm -hmm. protein mm -hmm. and they're not accounted for. Could, could be. Could so be. I, I don't have much experience with... But if, if we assume that, so they're, they are basically that the total volume is not the same. Can it's we... Can we make uh, that assumption? It's, it's like it's like the scattering from. So probably yes. Well, one one has to look at the data. Besides, in in this kind in this case, I would recommend to perform sax experiments with different amount of additives to see is it really the additives. Yeah. So if if you repeat the experiment with uh, with folded protein and with uh, without the additives, do you still have the same effect? Yeah. So I would rule out everything else before trying to do this corrections. All right. So Thank you. you know. So maybe one last question? Okay, very well. We are well on time. So let's go have some lunch and thank you for your attention. <laughs>